Okay. Right, so I'm just checking this stream on the other end, and we should be live. Da -da -da. Okay, so welcome, Simon. Um, How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm all right. I managed to uh, wrap two hours early. My good, good for thing. you. Yes. Good for you. Good. That's nice. How was your How was your shooting? How's your shooting you going? Know what? It's going really well. We're we're shooting ten hour days. We're finishing at six pm every night. Then I watch dailies, um, which is great. We're in the we're in a, a proper cinema watching dailies uh, project. Oh wow! So it, you know it's pretty cool. I get to hear all of my work from from uh, yesterday, the day after I shoot it on a on a proper sound system, which has just been installed by Dolby into Leveson. So you know what? I couldn't really ask for more. It's you know you kind of. You you pick up subtle nuances of uh, of what's going on with background noise and and, rec and recording technique, um, in a way that you don't just through through listening through headphones. So it's pretty cool. See, yeah, that's fantastic. Well, we're um we're obviously talking about green sleeve. Um, so why didn't you just kind of uh, intro with the uh, the kind of um the aim of green sleeve and what it's for and what it does and just and just tell us a bit about it. Okay. Well, the the green sleeve has kind of come about uh, since. We uh, we started working on big visual effects movies. I think I was thinking about it on the on the drop way driving home tonight about about what the catalyst was for us designing Green Sleeve, and the first the first film where we really really started thinking about what could be achieved was working with a visual effects supervisor called Peter Chang, who's kind of world famous. He's the best guy in the world. Uh, working on on Paul Greengrass's Green Zone. And we were shooting in Morocco, and Peter was working with us closely. And Paul would say, "Look, we're going to do this little scene here, and uh, and we're going to be in the middle of Baghdad." And we'd look, and we'd be on like a dirty bit of uh, scrubland with no buildings around us. And Peter would say, "Yeah." And, and at this point, the Chinooks are going to fly in. And uh, me and my team were kind of looking at each other, and we were just gobsmacked at what could be achieved. And uh, and that was a number of years ago now. And since then, we've we've moved from sort of one big visual effects movie to the next. And what we've noticed is, is that uh, we're now shooting more and more, not just on big movies, but on medium size and lower budget movies we're shooting against green screens. And it's not just big action movies where we're going to build the Baghdad skyline and have Chinooks flying in the background uh, on, a, on a kind of town square in Morocco. But we're also, when we're in, in the studio, rather than having a painted, uh, a scenic art backdrop out the back of some windows or you know as someone walks in through the front door or for instance when we were just shooting with Guy Ritchie we had a big castle entrance and uh, and the knights would arrive at the castle entrance and behind them we'd be shooting onto green now one of the issues was was that uh, you know we needed to get the microphones close we know that we can put the microphones into the green screen itself that's never been a problem everyone gets that um, you know, we started doing that on commercials in the 90s when green screen and blue screens first started getting used. You know, we'd, we'd put the mics into the green and the blue and, uh, and it was absolutely fine because, as you know, all they need is a couple of inches around the edge of the face and the head um, to be able to mat out and then they're going to replace the background. Um, the problem comes when you're using a green screen and you have real props, real sets, and deep two shots with foreground actors or perhaps background artists walking through shot and that's when you have things that are real in front of the green screen that you can't cross with a boom pole that are not allowing you to get the microphone as close to the actor as you could if your boom pole was green and this was quite simple um you know we kept on having visual effects supervisors when we were saying look can we cross through that doorway or can we can we cross that? Uh, you know, can we cross through those background actors in in the background there, or can we cross through the ship sail? Okay, to the, get to the captain doing dialogue, steering the ship. Okay, they'd always say, "Well, yeah, you can, but have you got a green pole?" And that kept on coming up and kept on coming up. And uh, and at the same time, we're looking at the way that the stunt departments are working now and what they're doing with wire rigs and they're painting their wire rigs green and attaching them to actors. And so you know, there's. There's been an evolution, and I think that we need the sound department need to get on board with that. Everyone's using visual effects to their uh, to their advantage. You know, it's not just about painting in uh, effects behind people in scenes in movies. It's also there to be able to help us. It helps the stunt department achieve uh, excellence at work, 
We need to have it help us achieve excellence, and that's what the green sleeve is there to do. It's there to cover your boom pole with green lycra so that you can cross real set and real actors with that boom pole in an effort to get the microphone closer to the person talking. Now, what's interesting about that is when you're on exteriors and you're shooting green screen, one of the things that you will come up against in the production sound department is um, directors and special effects departments wanting to use um, wanting to use fans um, as false wind. So a lot of the time, and in, on interiors as well, on interiors when we're shooting interior for exterior, in other words, we're shooting on a sound stage, okay, and in and we're shooting two guys talking, and we're against a green screen. And in the finished movie, that scene that we're shooting, that green screen is going to be replaced with an exterior, uh, an exterior scene. Okay, so the director is obviously going to want to put wind in the hair and wind in the costume, which is another reason why we can't have the boom five or six foot above someone's head when we're working with uh, a wind machine. We need to get the microphone two inches from the actor's hairline, and that's what the the green sleeve covering the boom is going to allow you to do. The other reason why we have to get the boom two inches from the actor's hairline when we're shooting green screen and when we've got a wind machine is because, as every production sound mixer knows, where do Lavaliers fall over? They fall over as soon as they go in the wind because you can't protect them properly. We can all try our best with all sorts of products. You know, there's some great new products, Ryko overcovers, bumblebees, you know, but at the end of the day, as soon as you put a microphone, a lavalier into hard wind, you're going to have problems. Whereas you can put a boom microphone, whether it's a Sherps or a Sennheiser or a DPA, if it's in a good blimp and it's got a furry cover on it, you can get away with a lot heavier wind than you would be able to with a lavalier. And so, what the green sleeve is allowing us to do, it's allowing us to get those booms closer to the actors um, when we're working against green screen. Fantastic, and you have, uh, I believe, um, an actual product that you can show on the on the screen. Yeah, I brought one home. It's it's the prototype. Um, you know, my team have been working on it. It's it's been designed by Arthur Fenn, who's done forty eight movies with me. Um, and you know, and he was bored of having visual effects supervisors say, "Yeah, you could do it if you had a green pole." And he said, "Look, I'm I'm going to get this made." And so he's been researching it, and we've been through a few different prototypes. And what I'm going to show you is the prototype. Uh, that, that we've decided on that's gone into production. And that's uh, that's what size it is, okay? That's, wow. that's what you're carrying around, okay? So it's, it's nothing big, it's very lightweight, okay? Now, I take it out of there. It's literally, okay, it's a green, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit back a little bit. So yeah, yeah, so we can see what it. I'm talking about. Okay, so that's, there you go, there's our little logo there, that's, that's kind of cool. Okay. Ah, nice, nice. Okay. So that little finger pull there is how you pull it onto the pole. Okay. And it's made of very, very lightweight lycra. And we'll talk about that in a second. But you're basically going to put the tip of your pole through it and you're going to pull it down your pole, down your pole, down your pole, down your pole, down your pole. And this is as long as three sections on a Panamic Maxi. So that the section, the fourth section that you're holding in your hand, okay. Is still going to be black, all right? Because that's never going to need to go in frame. The one thing that we can be sure about when we're shooting with green screens is that you're going to need to be working generally on a very long pole, okay? So at the end here, we've gone into something a little bit more rigid than the lycra, okay? So at the end, we've gone into something that the the tip of the of the pole slips into. There's a washer with inside, which is inside there. Okay, that's a washer which fits exactly onto the end of a boom pole, and through here you've got a little, a little machine slip there that your cable, that your uh, tail comes out of the microphone into the mount, and then it goes inside the green sleeve and then goes down the pole in the English manner. Okay, for you American guys who are watching this, obviously you're going to have internally. Uh, cable boom poles. We don't do that in Europe, generally, especially not in England. We have we still have the cable wrapped around the outside of the boom pole. That's how we like to work. Um, the green sleeve is it was designed for a Panamic Maxi, but it will fit any boom pole, and uh, and that's basically what it is. It's very very lightweight lycra, and it scrunches up, and that's what you do. And to 
And to put it onto a boom pole takes literally, it takes less than a minute, okay? And that's, that's what you need. Now, when you look at that and you think, well, that's very, very simple. Um, it's not over-engineered. Well, why is that? It's because the moment you try to over-engineer anything that touches a boom pole, it creates noise, okay? So what we've looked for is the, the least obtrusive, quietest fabric that we could possibly use. And that's why we've gone for very, very thin grade Lycra, because it can be attached to the boom pole and it's not gonna add any handling noise. The other reason why we haven't got it down the actual part, it doesn't cover the whole part of the pole that you're gonna use with your hands, is because you don't want any fabric between your hands and the boom pole. That's a very, very carefully engineered piece of, piece of equipment. Okay, and you don't want to do anything that changes that relationship between the human hands and the boom pole itself. Okay, but from the moment you get to the first extension on your boom pole, where you're going to go like that with your first extension, that's where the uh, that that's where the green sleeve starts. And so you can use a Panamic Maxi boom pole, which is four sections long. You're holding section number four, and you can extend it out three sections. Your three sections that extend all the way out are going to be covered by green sleeve. Now, if you're not working on three sections, okay, up by where your, your first hand is, okay, you're just going to have a nice little bunch of frilly fabric, okay, which isn't going to weigh you down. It's very, very lightweight and it's just going to bunch up. Um, again, we tried lots of different ways of doing it. We tried some much thicker material, okay, and then we would have been limited to a certain length of boom pole and we would have been saying, guys, We'd like you to, uh, to consider having a, a three section green sleeve, a two section and a one section, and you'll swap them depending on how long your pole needs to be. And that didn't work for us. What we wanted to do was have something which you put on your boom pole and you forgot about it. And if you needed to go three quarters of a section longer because you need to get to an actor who's deeper in the background, you just use it. You're not saying, oh, I need to swap my green sleeve because as we all know, that's not gonna work. No one's gonna wait for that. They're yeah. gonna say, yeah, yeah, we'll go with the radios, roll sound. So, yeah. so that's that's where we are with it, you know. And what we're trying to achieve is, we, you know, at the moment I'm kind of on a drive. I'm working very, very closely with with a lot of visual effects supervisors who I'm shooting with, and I'm kind of reporting back to the production sound community. We're all taking huge steps forward. All of us um, doing um, television and films. We're talking a lot about visual effects. We've got the the thing that we that. I kind of pioneered on Les Mis, where we painted out the Lavaliers. Um, the reason we painted out Lavaliers on Les Mis was because the director, it's an old story, the director didn't want to ADR anything. Why did we go with Lavaliers, not booms? Well, because when you're, re when you're recording uh, a vocal that's going to be put to music, you can't have any shifts in perspective. You can only have one perspective, and that perspective has to be close up. As any studio engineer who works on pop records is going to tell you. So that's why we went with the Lavalier paint out on uh, on Les Mis. But since then, you know, we've we've had people across in in, in California and New York, um, and they they've been adding with their workflows. And I know that David Fincher um, and his sound team on Gone Girl were, have kind of pioneered putting the boom into frame and matting it out uh, when you've got a static shot. This is not working with a green screen. This is just saying, okay, we've got two cameras rolling. One of the cameras rolling tight. The other camera's rolling wide. Let's leave the booms out of frame for a couple of seconds after the clapperboard goes in. And then, so they get their frame grab, and then the booms can come in and enter. And you know what? If they are going to use that wide shot, they can easily use that frame grab to just mat out the top of the frame. Um, it's a very, very quick replacement. The guys that I've been talking to are saying that that's not even a VFX replacement, that that's something that can happen in an offline edit. It really is that simple. Oh, wow. it, has, it has no impact on a visual effects budget. Um, and then the other thing that's happening that's interesting is we let's talk about the guys, um, Lorenzo Milan, who's working on House of Cards, um, yeah. which again, the catalyst for this was, was House of Cards um, was... Uh, has Fincher as, I think he directed one of the first ones, he's certainly one of the executive producers. Yeah. And uh, and I think that he was the, the guy that came on and said, listen, you know, we don't want to ADR any of this, and kind of gave the confidence and support to the production sound department in the first place to say, look, let's consider putting the booms into frame. And on House of Cards, they're shooting 6K on red. 
Um, and, you know, red cameras uh, at, the, at that kind of level of detail, you can start zooming in. So a lot of the time with those guys, they're putting the booms into these big architectural wide shots. But actually, in post, um, the producers and directors are deciding to zoom in on the 6K anyway, and the booms perhaps aren't in frame anyway. And so I think that everyone, you know, we're all taking our steps forward with trying to get production sound to be, uh, to, to, to be able to benefit. And, you know, what is production sound? Production sound is saving actors' original performances. You know, and that's, that's what I always bang on about. And, and so we can all benefit from this. No, definitely. It seems to be um, a, a trend that uh, is going in the right direction in terms of just collaboration with directors and, and, and utilizing uh, techniques that are effectively getting cheaper and cheaper in terms of uh, VFX time and VFX budget. And like you say, with um, even just the matting being an offline edit, it's, it's kind of no, no sweat, but with extra production value. Well, the, the interesting thing is a, a, couple of th a couple of notes. The first note is when we spoke on Les Mis, which I think was the first time we started talking about painting microphones out. Someone feel free to correct me, but I, I believe that that was the first time we, we, we deliberately painted mics out. I'm sure people have been painting mics out that have been yeah. in by mistake for a number of years. But we deliberately went into that show saying we're going to paint mics out. And Deborah Haywood, one of the, one of the producers from Working Title, who was extremely supportive of this whole idea and workflow, said to me, listen, you know, if Tom had said in Les Mis, we want to have um, a, v a VFX mushroom in every frame, he's the director. That's what we would have made for him. You know, and at the end of the day, if the director's saying to us, I don't want to ADR or anything, and you're going to have to paint the microphones out, that's what we're going to do for him. You know, and that's, that's the way the, the movie business works. And so we, we have to give these, these directors confidence that we're going to supply the goods, that they are not going to have to ADR if they can work with us on this. And guess what? That ADR budget can be reassigned and put into the VFX budget to remove the microphones, which is a no-brainer because you're spending the same kind of money, but guess what? You're not having to re-record the original performances. So creatively, you're gaining. Now, there's been some kind of, you know, I've had a couple of guys in post say to me, yeah, yeah, but you know, ADR can be a good thing. Yeah, right, ADR can be a great thing. If a director and some actors get into post-production and they go, you know what, we were pushed for time on that scene and I'm not sure it's quite right. We, you know, can we try and soften it? Or do you think that, uh, that at that point you, you, know, you should have perhaps been a little bit more angry or shocked? Then that's what ADR is for. ADR is a great tool for changing performances and making the, process, make, making the, the film better. Okay? But when the actor and, and, the, and the directors thought, think to themselves, you know what, we nailed that scene. You know? yeah. so we're so happy with it. And they get into post and they can hear that drill that was in the background because the boom was five foot wider than it had to be. Okay. Or they can hear, you know, the air conditioning running that the production sound mixer couldn't get turned off because, you know, because the building would have blown up. But had they decided to move the microphones into frame and just take that screen grab or put the green sleeve on and put it in against the backing, okay, then suddenly the gain comes down. Okay, there's less background noise, and that problematic uh, background issue isn't problematic anymore. It's disappeared, and you're not having to ADR that scene that they loved, and that they forever say, you know what, it was never as good as the original. Yeah, you know, that's, that's got to be the worst thing. It's got to be the worst thing. Yeah. So, you know, um, what we're trying to do is we're all trying to, I think, all of us right now, I'm hearing loads of uh, UK sound mixers who are working in television saying, yeah, you know what, we did the House of Cards workflow today and, uh, and it was really well received and everyone appreciated it. I think that everyone's starting to understand. And you know what, Matt, I was kind of planning this interview earlier and I was thinking about what I was going to say. And another thing that I really want to draw everyone's attention to is how long have we in the sound department been being told, don't worry, we'll fix it in post? <laughs> yeah. Right. So now we're saying, you know what, guys, don't worry. You can fix it in post. We can get you the production dialogue, and guess what? You can fix it in post. And it seems to me to me to be a no-brainer that we put a green boom pole against a green screen and get you great production dialogue, or we shoot a screen grab for a couple of seconds of a static wide shot and put the booms in. 
if we can save that creative performance that is unique and special. And after all, that's what we're all there to do. Whether we're shooting, you know, a, a kids TV drama or whether we're shooting a Hollywood, you know, $250 million movie, what is every single person on that set there to do? We're there with techno cranes and, you know, 50 trucks and, you know, steady cams and, and 17 grips. What are we all there to do? We're there to capture that performance. And everything else has to fall in line behind that. And I think that as sound mixers, it's our job. I think it would be irresponsible if we weren't talking openly with directors and producers about what can be achieved. And the, you know, and the green sleeve is just another step towards that goal. And, and with the green sleeve, you know what? You don't even need to have a conversation about it. The green sleeve goes in. No one, you know, the VFX uh, supervisors, the directors, the producers, they're not even going to say, hey, 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 there's a, there's a boom there. It's com completely intuitive, instinctive, and, you know, uh, unob unobtrusive to everyone when they see something green working against green. You don't even need to talk about it. It just happens. It just gets removed. No, it's fantastic. In it, coming back to, um, uh, I guess, the practicalities of using using the um, the green sleeve. So, so the ring. So you're you're kind of going from the tip all the way down to the uh, the grip. So you've got the tip yeah. of the microphone, which has got which has got a thread on it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. The, yeah. Tip of the boom pole. Okay, which is removable on a Panamic, which has got a thread on it and a washer. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. So what? you do with the green sleeve is you you pull here it is yeah yeah you pull you pull that on that's that's the end bit and out out of the end bit there you're going to have your thread okay yeah. and okay. in this piece right at the end we've got an o-ring washer which is exactly the right size okay which is going to hold the green screen tight on the end okay right, and hold it taut. Right. okay so that basically you're going to stretch it and it's not going to be all baggy Okay, it's it's going to basically be stretched and uh, and be the same the same diameter as the boom pole. Um, and with it, um, with you using kind of pan panamics as um, I guess your base, have you tested with any uh, kind of locking and unlocking boom poles when you're kind of opening and closing? Will it kind of stretch further to accommodate different types of uh, locking mechanisms? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it will only go as long as a maxi panamic. But I believe that there's only one or two boom poles that are longer than that. Anyway. Yeah. I think that's like five five meters in total. Yeah. The first, the first assistants that I work with don't want to work with anything longer than a maxi panamic. That's as long as yeah. they want to go. Um, and so that's that's what we've what we've designed for. And every other boom pole that we've put into the the green sleeve has worked absolutely fine. Um, we may start. You, you know, the, the next step is to make the the, the blue sleeve. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. On twenty percent of the VFX shots that we're doing, we're using blue, and that depends on how much green there is in the actors' costumes. Okay. If you've got a if you've got a, a film that you're making where one of the leading characters has a lot of green in their costume, that that's perhaps going to push the visual effects department to go blue on that movie. Blue is not their favorite anymore. Green is green is what they want to work with. You also have other movies where, but where sometimes you're going to be doing a lot of visual effects on night scenes. And in my experience, and not everyone follows this, but in my experience, a lot of DPs want to use blue on night scenes because um, they get less of a green bounce off the green screens. Okay. Yep. The effects supervisors quite like the green because the green is easier to key out. You get it. You can see a harder line. And also, there's you know you don't have a problem with with navy blues um, in dark sequences against the blue screen, and you being able to find that line that you're trying to key out. That's why green is very popular. But people do work with blue, and we want to be ready for that. Um, we're not planning right now to make anything shorter because, as I say, generally on these scenes with green screens, and generally for the you know where the green sleeve comes in handy. It's when you're using two booms and the second boom is getting something deep, okay? In other words, it's generally a fully extended boom pole. And why does that need to, need to be a green sleeve? It's because generally you've got something in foreground, whether it's, as I say, a ship's mast or whether it's another actor who's speaking or whether it's just background actors on a street scene who are crossing through, okay? You can't cross those guys with a black boom pole, okay? That would be... A hellish paint out for visual effects 
and there'd be phone calls the next morning saying, what on earth happened on the set? This is, you know, this has added a lot of money to our budget. Um, but, you know, with those background actors who are walking down that street scene, if you're behind them getting the guy walking down the street scene talking and you've got green, okay, crossing the background actors in foreground, you haven't got a problem. It's just like they're standing in front of a green screen. Green screen, green boom, boom pole, it's all the same deal. Yeah, okay, okay. It's a and difficult thing to describe without actually having the shots in front of you. Yes, no, your, your picture helped online. It's basically like when it's like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And exactly. you can't, it wouldn't work obviously like this, but behind then there's no problem because it's exactly. green. Exactly, yes, you're absolutely right. You yeah. can't have anything going across the front. Yeah, okay. yeah, look, no, that's what I Let's say there's a guy behind me, okay. Um, yeah. I'm going to show you where, okay. Yep. All right, so imagine that I'm talking here, okay, yep. all right, and I've got a green screen behind me. Yeah. And then you've got me, <laughs> and I'm talking here. Okay, now that that second boom pole, let's say it can't come in from over that side to get to the guy there because that's where the key light is. So the boom pole has to be coming in through there, through the back of my head, okay? And that back wall is green, okay? That boom pole can come through the back of my head to get the microphone there, there on me, okay? with the boom operator working over there because he can't work over there because of the key light, okay? With the other actor who's in foreground here with a boom pole coming through the back of his head. Whereby if that boom operator was on a black pole, suddenly this microphone wouldn't be here anymore to make sure that that boom pole wasn't growing through the, the head of the guy in foreground here that microphone would suddenly be three foot up in the air with perhaps a fan blowing wind into my face to get my hair moving. So suddenly you can see where we're going to be increasing productivity. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, you know, we're just trying to send better sound in for, for, for directors and this is the way we're going to do it. Fantastic. And just uh, kind of finally picking up on the point of, um, so when you've, you've put the green sleeve over, and you say that it's it's quite tight because it's hanging on with the washer. Is yeah. it does it need to connect to anything? Do I need to have my hand over it? Is it just kind of sitting well, um, kind of loose? Doesn't need to connect to anything. But what Arthur likes to do is he actually puts his finger through the end of it there. Okay, right. so the right. thing that we originally put on to pull it on to make it a very quick pull on. Okay, he actually hooks that through his finger and works with it through his finger, so he holds it tight that way. But it, you don't need to have it like that. It's absolute, You can work with your hand on it if you want to, okay? Or you can work with it just bunched up loose around uh, and you're not holding onto it at all. It's so light and so unobtrusive. The only, the only thing that's an issue, really, is putting it onto the boom pole, and that takes less than a minute. Once it's on there, once it's on there, you fit it and forget about it. It's, it's cool. Um, it's not going to cause you any more issues. No, fantastic. And and do you want to tell the guys kind of when it will be kind of shipping and the prices and US and everything yeah. like that? I mean, right now we're we're looking to be shipping it at the end of next week. Um, it's ninety pounds plus VAT if you're in England. I guess I haven't looked into it. You don't have to pay the VAT if you're if you're buying it from out of England. And so um, I'm going to look into that and it will be whatever in dollars, 90 pounds is. Um, and what are, here's, here's another point. On all of the movies that I'm doing now, you know, Tessa tape, uh, yeah. now all of these different things are consumables. What I'd like to think about green sleeves is really it should be something which the production company are buying for the production sound mixers at the beginning of a movie. I think that these things are gonna, they're gonna last you five or six movies or a couple of years. And then probably because they're so lightweight, because that's what we need so that they don't become obtrusive, you're probably gonna need an another new one after a couple of years. That, you know, it's a, con it's, a, it's a consumable. And I think that it's something which actually production sound mixers should be passing on the cost. Certainly if you're doing big movies, this should go on your consumables list. Um, it's very, very simple to explain why you need it and why you're going to benefit from it. 
you know, it seems to be to to me to be a no brainer. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I I think we've kind of uh, kind of covered covered everything with it. I guess we'll kind of just wait for uh, people to get their hands on them and just to see see even more uh, kind of demonstrations and even more kind of good stuff that you've uh, kind of been posting out, like your House of Cards article and the Gong Girl, just in terms of just getting more of that general knowledge out there um, and well, just well, making it commonplace. Yeah. That article actually was written by Sam Cousins, who I just want to big up in this interview. Sam has kind of collated together everyone's different experiences working and the workflows that they've used uh, with visual effects paint out, all the way from Lamy's painting out the Lavaliers to House of Cards, uh, where, you, where they're doing matte uh, frame grabs and working with the booms in the wide shots, to the first guys that did that workflow uh, on 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 Fincher's movie, which was which was Gone Girl, and actually we did it. We we did it also. I think um, I remember t telling you guys we did it on Les Mis with the boom pole, simply because in the middle of I Dreamed a Dream, Anne Hathaway did that on the. We were shooting the first rehearsal, and she clutched her chest, which is exactly where our our little DPA forty seventy one was, and we went like that, and and you know and. That was, as you know, an extremely emotive performance. And I went up to Tom, you know, they said, Look, leave the camera rolling, we're gonna go again. I went, okay, leave the camera rolling, but let me speak to Tom. I said, Tom, listen, she's gonna clutch her chest and, and we can't do it with the Lavalier. And he said, well, what are you gonna do? We're not gonna tell her not to clutch her chest. Look at her, she's having a breakdown. And, uh, and I said, look, what we've gotta do is we've gotta put the booms into the wide shot. We were shooting three cameras, so we had direct action cuts on that. So that if, right. if it was the take, we had it from three different angles. We were shooting a wide, a mid, and a tight. And we actually, and the mid and the tight had the same headroom, which was literally four inches, and the wide was really wide. And, uh, and we, we put the boom into the wide, and it didn't infiltrate the edges on the mid and the tight. And that was actually, so I Dreamed a Dream was actually recorded on a boom. Um, it was recorded on a Lavalier as well, but guess what, when she did that, it, yeah. it, you know, <laughs> it was a came in. Um, yeah. So you know, it's moments, moments like that where you know, as as production sound uh, mixers, we you know we need to be able to negotiate with directors and, and make them un, you know make them aware of what's of what's available for them to make their movies better. And it's nothing that a stunt coordinator wouldn't say. You know, say look, we can achieve that if we put a green cable through the back of shot and drag them out. It's nothing that you know. Um, any other department wouldn't use um, to benefit their creativity and enable them to do a better job for the director. And that's how we should be thinking. You know, um, we shouldn't be kind of tied into this almost misguided pride that we can do this without getting the mics in shot. Because you know what? Something that, uh, you know, one of the guys who taught me told me many years ago, the audience don't care what mics you used, whether you used booms or lavaliers. I'd love to do everything on a boom. I'd love to, you know. But at the end of the day, if the lavalier is going to get me better sound, or if the boom can come into frame and get me better sound, I don't care what brand it is. I don't care, you know, how we achieved it. All I want is whatever is going to capture that original performance in the most transparent and natural way possible. With the least amount of background noise, and that's what that's what we should all be striving for. Well, I think that is just the perfect end to uh, a, a brilliant chat about green sleeve. So, cool. I, yeah, I'm going to kind of end the video here, and we can uh, chat a bit offline. Just, um, let me just say one thing to anyone that was watching this, guys. Yeah. Guys, you should have been out watching a live band tonight. Okay, <laughs> listening to this Friday night. Okay, if you're as sad as me and Matt, and you're talking, about, and you're listening, you're watching a video about green sleeves. Okay, okay, you're hardcore, but literally go out and uh, and listen to some live music now because it's Friday night. Have a good time. <laughs> Fantastic, and as always, guys, I'll catch you all later.